Question one is just the honesty question. Now question two, we actually get into the science. This is asking about ethylene glycol, and we say that it's got a boiling temperature, give it a heat capacity, so this is probably a heat capacity problem. How much heat? Okay, so this is asking us the heat required, probably to change the temperature, to heat 698 grams, so that's the amount in mass, uh, from 113.2 to its boiling point, which is given. So since this is a heat capacity problem, our basic equation is that the heat required is the mass times the specific heat times the temperature change. So we need to find these different quantities. Here, the mass is given. It's 698 grams. We may need to change that to kilograms. The heat capacity is given as 2.36 kilograms per kilojoules Kelvin. Here, where it shows Kelvin, as a lowercase k is a typographic error. And delta t, well that's the final temperature minus the initial temperature. The final temperature is its boiling point of 197.3 Celsius and its initial temperature is 113.2 Celsius. You may ask, isn't it necessary to convert the temperature from Celsius to Kelvin because the heat capacity is given in Kelvin? Well, it turns out that the difference between two temperatures in Celsius is the same difference if you do it to Kelvin, because changing from Celsius to Kelvin, all you're doing is adding the same number to the Celsius degrees. And when you subtract then the difference, that's not going to change anything. So the difference in Celsius and the difference in Kelvin is the same number. So our number here for delta T, 197.3 minus 113.2. That's 84.1 Kelvin or Celsius. We'll keep it in Kelvin because that's what the heat capacity is in. Now notice, we want the answer in joules, it says. How much heat in joules, it asks us. If we use this number, we're going to get kilojoules per kilogram, so we'd get our answer in kilojoules. However, we're giving an input in grams, so it might be simpler to convert the heat capacity to joules per gram than to convert the mass to kilograms. So let's do that. Kilojoules per kilogram is just going to be the same thing as joules per gram. So we have two... 0.36 joules per gram Kelvin. And now we can just get our answer. So we have M, that's 698 grams. C, that's 2.36 joules per gram Kelvin. And delta T, that's 84.1 Kelvin grams cancel out, the kelvins cancel out, and we get how much heat in joules. So when the dust settles, in terms of our numbers, we have 698 times 2.36 times 84.1. We're going to get a pretty big number. And I get 138536. And in reality, we don't have that many significant figures. We have at most three significant figures. So 139,000 um, would be perfectly sufficient. Question three. We have a new metal, vibranium, so a fictional metal, and so we've, we're given a heat input and a mass. We're given a temperature change, so this is asking the heat capacity. So we're going to need the same equation. We just need to solve it for a different quantity. So again, we're going to use the same formula. Q equals mass times specific heat times temperature change. Except this time, we're trying to find the heat capacity, C. We'll solve for C. And so we get Q over M delta T. Q is 85.5 joules. M is 28.06 grams. Delta T is 28.8 degrees Celsius. And it wants our answer in joules per kilogram Celsius. So we've got Celsius. Uh, we've got joules, however we need this to be in kilograms to get an answer in kilograms that we can convert now. So this will be 0 0.02806 kilograms. We can just plug that in. C equals 85.5 joules divided by 0 0.02806 kilograms divided by a temperature change of 28.8. 
Celsius. So we're going to get an answer in joules per kilogram Celsius. That's nice. For the numbers, we just need to do, in this case, 85.5 divided by the product of 0 0.02806 times 28.8. And I get 105.8 joules per kilogram Celsius. Next, we have a question about a reaction. Explosive decomposition of a high explosive. So 0.119 mole sample. Uh, we get 489.7 joules of work and 489 joules of heat. We need to know what the enthalpy of decomposition is. So decomposition is this reaction. So it's reminding us of the sign. Remember the sign convention that when energy is added to the system, that's positive. When the system is adding energy to its surroundings, that's negative. So in this case, the system is doing work on its surroundings and it's adding heat to the surroundings. So in both cases, the heat and the work are negative. So what we're given is we have a number of moles. We have work done. And this is going to be negative. And we have a heat added to the system, also negative. And we need to find delta H. So delta H for a reaction that's carried out at constant pressure, which most chemical reactions are unless we specify that it's done at constant volume or inside a pressurized container or something like that. So delta H is going to be the heat part. And then we want to find per mole. So we're going to have kilojoules per Q over N. Now this is in joules, so we want to turn this into kilojoules to make this work. So this is going to be negative 0 0.4989 kilojoules. If we do that, we'll get our answer in kilojoules per mole. So here we have the heat in kilojoules, negative 0 0.4989 kilojoules and the number of moles, so that's 0 0.119 moles. Between the numbers, 0.4989 divided by 0.119 gives us 4.19192 kilojoules per mole. Next, lactic acid. So we've got a formula C3H6O3. Balance the chemical equation. So let's see how we do this. We start with the lactic acid C3H6O3. The only place that carbon shows up in the reactants is the lactic acid. The only place it shows up in the products is the carbon dioxide. Notice there's three atoms of carbon in the lactic acid and one of carbon in the carbon dioxide. So there has to be three times as many moles of carbon dioxide as there are lactic acid. So we're going to say one to three. We may have to adjust these up or down, but these factors are going to stay the same. Oxygen is going to be a little bit harder to balance because oxygen is in every single species. So let's do the other element that's left, and that's the hydrogen. So in the reactants, we the only place where hydrogen shows up is the lactic acid. There's six atoms in the lactic acid, and the only place it shows up in the products is the water, where there are two. So there need to be three times as many water molecules produced as we have lactic acid. So that's going to be one to three here. That leaves us the oxygen balance. This is a little tougher. So in the reactants, we can adjust the amount of oxygen. We start out seeing that we have three atoms in the lactic acid, and then we can adjust the amount in the oxygen. In the products, we've got three times two, that's six atoms of oxygen in the carbon dioxide, and then three times one, that's nine. So we need to make the reactants equal nine. We've got three already, so we need to get six more from the oxygen. We can do that with an integer coefficient. That's real nice. And that integer coefficient is three. So one, three, 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 
gives us the right amount of everything. It gives us three atoms of carbon, it gives us six atoms of hydrogen, and it gives us three plus six is nine, and six plus three is nine atoms of oxygen. Next one is asking an enthalpy change in kilojoules per mole. So this is an enthalpy change of the reaction. This gives us the enthalpies of formation of the substances. So to find the enthalpy of a reaction, you take the enthalpies of formation of the products and you subtract the enthalpies of formation of the reactants. The reason for this is because of Hess's law. The enthalpies of formation essentially are what the heat would be if we created the compounds from their elements. What you're essentially saying is the products part, you're creating the products from their elements. Then for the reactants, if you do minus the enthalpy change of the reactants, that's saying that you, it's the heat required to transform the reactants into their elements. So we're formally taking the reactants, turning them into their elements, and then turning the elements into the products. Since that's the same starting point and the same ending point as the reaction of interest, the enthalpy for that process is the same as the enthalpy of the reaction of interest. So how do we do that? Well, our products are CO2 and H2O, but for one mole of lactic acid, we make three moles of carbon dioxide and three moles of water. So we need to take three times the enthalpy of formation of carbon dioxide and three times the enthalpy of formation of water. Then we'll subtract from that three times the enthalpy of formation of oxygen and one time the enthalpy of formation of the lactic acid. Uh, carbon dioxide minus 393.52 This is all kilojoules per mole. And then we add to it three times the enthalpy of formation of water, so that's minus 285.83. Then we subtract three times the enthalpy of formation of oxygen, which is zero because it's an element in its standard state. And we subtract from it one time the enthalpy of formation of lactic acid, which is minus 675.21. All the units are the same. We add these all up. 675.21 minus 3 times 393 minus 3 times 285. I end up with minus 1362.84 kilojoules per mole. And we can use all those significant figures if we want to. Um, we're, we're entitled to those. We haven't lost anything. Minus 1362.84. Question seven. Does this reaction absorb heat from the surroundings or does it release heat to the surroundings? Remember our convention. The enthalpy tells us the heat absorbed by the reaction when we're carrying this out at constant pressure. In this case, the heat absorbed is negative. So that means that it releases heat to the surroundings if it's absorbing negative heat. Is it exothermic or endothermic? Well, releasing heat to the surroundings is exothermic.